Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Melissa Scheffler. Merle has the night off. I'm Steve Dawson. The case of a woman claiming to be Elvis's half-sister will move forward in the courts. The estate of Elvis Presley's father has been reopened. Now this comes after a petition filed by a woman claiming to be Vernon Presley's love child, which would make her Elvis Presley's half-sister. Oxford's Lauren Lee joins us here in the studio with more on this perplexing legal affair. Lauren? That's right, Steve. The peti petitioner says she has DNA evidence to prove she is the daughter of Vernon Presley. She says a DA DNA sample of Elvis's proves that she is the king's half-sister. And she says she got the sample from Elvis himself. This is Eliza Presley. The Washington State resident is in Memphis to prove she is the daughter of Vernon Presley, the half-sister to Elvis Presley. Eliza and her attorney appeared in probate court Wednesday. Our uh, facts came out strongly, and we simply want a day for her to be heard uh, when all of the proof can come out. Eliza Presley, who recently changed her name from Alice Tiffin, did not speak on camera but made her case in open court. She says she supplied Elvis' DNA to the first firm DNA Consulting, and the results prove she is Elvis's half-sister. She says she got the DNA evidence from Jesse Presley. She says Jesse Presley is the assumed name of Elvis Presley. So her claim is Elvis himself licked an envelope and sent it her way. She says DNA Consulting processed the sample this summer, even comparing it to DNA from some of Elvis's first cousins. And they've been tested and retested by various labs and the proof is conclusive that her allegations are correct. Eliza says her quest to find her father started when she found out she was adopted. She says her birth mother lived across the street from Graceland and says she spent time with the Presley family as a teenager. But she says her mother denies Vernon Presley, 25 years her senior, is the father. The attorney for Elvis Presley Enterprises was speechless when asked about the claim that Elvis lives under the assumed name Jesse and surprised the judge reopened Vernon's estate. Uh, we've only had to come in the court on on two, but we've had at least uh, we've had dozen, at least a dozen people claim that they are children of primarily children of Elvis. This is the first children of a child of Vernon that we've had. Probate court judge Karen Webster said by reopening the estate, she was not ruling on the paternity or heirship, but her ruling does allow the case to go forward. I don't understand what the purpose is going to be. We're going to have a reopened estate, but she's not going to determine heirship, and there's no money. Eliza said she just wants to be acknowledged by the Presley family. Eliza Presley's attorney says reopening the estate allows her to issue summons to parties connected to Vernon Presley's estate. Elvis Presley Enterprises' attorney says she has no case because of statute of limitations and adoption laws. The next hearing has not been scheduled. And I just got off the phone with the DNA specialist out of Arizona. He says he believes Eliza is Elvis's half-sister and that Elvis is still alive. He says the proof is there. DNA evidence doesn't lie. In the studio, Lauren Lee, Fox 13. Okay, Mr. Presley, this has been a shocking 24 hours for me, but I've prepared many questions. To the public, you were an extraordinary entertainer. But um, off stage, I led a secret life as a federal drug enforcement agent. And I put my life on the line for America every day. And I ran a strike force that carried out dangerous undercover operations against the weather underground terrorists, the Black Panthers, and the mafia crime families. Well then, I don't know where to begin. Well, how about starting at the beginning? You know, to understand how I ended up here, you, you'll need to know everything about my life. Okay, uh, when and where were you born? Tupelo, Mississippi, January the 8th, 1935, at 510 and one half Maple Street. I had an identical twin brother, Jesse, who was stillborn. Tell me about your parents. Daddy was Vernon Elvis, and Mama was Gladys Love Presley. They were dirt poor, 
barely educated. Now, Daddy called me Evis, left out the L. He'd done stupid labor in the fields since he was 12. I was alone with Mama as a child because Daddy went to prison. I know what poverty is. I lived it for a long time. When we moved to Memphis, I was a small town boy in a big city without a dime. From the time I was a child, I was very close to Mama. We were like adhesive tape. If I was troubled about anything, I could wake her up any hour and she'd try to help me. I called her satin because her skin was soft and smooth as satin. She told me to have good manners, to help people, and to work hard and never give up. How did you start off in music? And where did your style come from? Actually, I was studying to be an electrician, and I got wired the wrong way. But as a child, I set my heart on singing, and nothing in this world could have stopped me. I was influenced by gospel music, rhythm and blues, but I never had a music lesson in my life. But I admired Maury Alonza. He was a fantastic entertainer. I watched the student prince over and over, and I stretched my voice to sing as high as he could. That was all the singing training I ever had. Then in high school, I entered a talent show, and I was amazed at just how popular I became. In 1954, I was considered a rockabilly singer. That was a mix of hillbilly music and rhythm and blues. At the time, country music was called hillbilly. Now, now the blues was created by black folks. So in the South, they called the blues sinful. So you see, I, I came along when there was no trend. So I became the trend. You had a three octave range. It was said you could sing with power or honest, pure sentiment. You mean like, love me tender, love me long. I tried to sing to suit every song. I could rage on, uh, well, since my head baby left me, Accuse on hound dog or bear my soul like in blue Hawaii. You know, if you're a gunslinger, you don't shoot with a bow and arrow. You know, they give me credit sometimes, but it's funny. I, I never wrote a song in my life. It made me look a lot smarter than I am. Your image, your look, it was the original cool. Where did you get your hairstyle from? The other guys wore GI haircuts, and I wanted to be different. I had read all the Captain Marvel Jr. comic books, and he was my hero. A real pinup. I realized I looked just like him, except actually I had blonde hair. So I dyed it black. I even combed out a few hairs over my forehead, like him. And I parted it on the right side, like Captain Marvel Jr. I was one good looking son of a bitch. <laughs> Then after that, I don't know why it happened, but my entire life was a mirror image of Captain Marvel Jr. Really? Your life was like a 1940s comic book character? You know, in fact, just about everything that happened to me, you can find in a Captain Marvel Jr. adventure. I kept my comic collection in the jungle room downstairs at Graceland. I think they still display my Captain Marvel Juniors at Graceland from time to time. I would read Captain Marvel Jr. every day just to know what was going to happen to me next. What did you know about Colonel Tom Parker when he became your manager? Well, I knew he had worked the carnivals and had been in the Army. Also, that he was behind Hattacall. From what I understood, it was mostly alcohol sold as medicine into dry counties in the South. When the colonel signed me, he promised Mama I'd be a millionaire in a year. The colonel got me my first big recording contract, and it came true. But Mama didn't care for the colonel because he never showed any emotion. She'd say he was strange and that he looked like a clown. I hated the business side, so I'd tell people, talk to the colonel. Just like he told me, I, I, I pretty much signed contracts without reading them. You know, the colonel was into some of everything. He got my music on the radio and helped it along by supplying women to the DJs. 
You know, he even sold I Hate Elvis Buttons. Later on, I realized the Colonel was a great promoter, but not so much as a manager. Anyway, he got me on television, and everything broke loose. When did the national controversy start over your stage movements? <laughs> Pretty much from my first national television show on Dorsey Brothers in 56. We'll do Elvis the Pelvis, all right? What did you think of the term Elvis the Pelvis? I didn't like it. It was probably the most childish expression I'd ever heard coming from an adult. People who read sex into my music had dirty minds. I just moved with music. I wouldn't do anything vulgar in front of anybody. Mama would never have allowed it. Time Magazine wrote, his entire body takes on a frantic quiver as if he had swallowed a jackhammer. It was a natural thing to me, rock and roll music. If you feel it, you can't help but move to it. Some people tap their feet, some people snap their fingers, some people sway back and forth. You know, I, I just sort of did them all together. The obscenity and vulgarity of the rock and roll music is obviously a means by which the white man and his children can be driven to the level with a nigger. It is obviously nigger music. Did you copy your stage movements from the Negro rhythm and blues performers? Absolutely not. In fact, Jackie Wilson said every colored entertainer had copied me. They even called him the Negro Elvis. Rhythm is something you either have or you don't have. But when you have it, you have it all over. Talent is being able to sell what you're feeling. What did you make of the hysteria of the girls? Almost a riot at every show. The first time, I didn't know what all the yelling was about. I didn't even realize my body was moving. So I asked the backstage manager, what I do? And he said, whatever it is, go back and do it again. Later on, I realized my music let loose a pent-up sexual frustration of some kind the teenagers had. I love the fans. I love the pretty girls. I wanted to run to them, not away from them. I got scratched up and bitten and everything, but I accepted it with a smile because they didn't intend to hurt me. They just wanted a piece of me for a souvenir. <laughs> Problem was, Mama worried I'd get stabbed. You know, when Mama worried, she drank alcohol. My reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it, and I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Do you think that your rocking and rolling has had an evil influence on teenagers? <laughs> Some reporters accused you of juvenile delinquency. Delinquency meant robbing, knife fighting, committing crimes. And I did nothing to cause that. I didn't see any type of music could have a bad influence on people. There's a big difference in singing on a record and singing for an audience. When people came out, they paid their money to see something with life in it. If I'd done nothing but sing, I'd have been cheating the audience. And they'd just stay at home with their records next time. Once, a judge in Florida threatened to have me arrested. Even had the police film the show. So I just stood still and wiggled my little finger, and the audience loved it. Do you recall the Milton Berle show? Yeah. It was painful because Milton came out dressed as my twin brother. Now, they had no idea I had a twin who died, Jesse. 
And that, like all surviving twins, I blamed myself for his death. I felt I had to make it up to Mama all of my life. Here is Elvis. Did you enjoy the Ed Sullivan TV show appearances? Yeah, but they'd only show me from the waist up. I was an ordinary, church-going country boy who just happened to love to sing rock and roll music. Ed Sullivan knew, and he tried to put an end to the criticism of me. That this is a real, decent, fine boy. Now, Steve Allen had me sing to a hound dog wearing a tux, which I regretted right away. I promised to always be myself after that experience. And then a guy at a gas station took a swing at me, and I hit him, and I had to go to court. I guess lots of people were waiting for that kind of thing to happen. And they used it to make me out as a delinquent. But what about the rumor that you once shot your mother? <laughs> well, I think that one takes the cake. But I figured when they quit talking about you, you're finished. Upside was, Movie studios got interested in me. Love Me Tender was my hit song at the time. So they asked me to star in a picture and everything. You know, I realized the movies were a lot like being on stage. Just be myself and it would come out better. The downside was my fame put me and Mama in two different worlds. It separated us. She loved that I had done something with my life, but she missed me so much. She felt she was losing me to the fans, to the Colonel. So when I was away, she drank more and more, mixed it with diet pills combined. So me going to the Army was the worst thing for her. In 1957, I took my armor physical, just like everyone. But I didn't imagine I'd get a notice for the draft. Hi. Hi. Congratulations, you are now in the Army. Entertainers usually only did USO shows. Why do you think you got drafted? I know why. When Jailhouse Rock came out, the colonel came to Graceland and told me he got a call from the Department of the Army in Washington. They told him the youth was going to hell in a handbasket because of me for a long time. And now Jailhouse Rock was the last straw because I was advocating for homosexuality. So they were drafting me into the U.S. Army to stop me. Really? Did you ask the colonel to get you out of it? I did, but the colonel said they threatened to deport him if he tried. That's when the colonel told me he was not really from West Virginia, and that his name wasn't even Tom Parker. He was Andres Cornelius Van Cook from Holland. He said when he was 18, he hired onto a boat and jumped ship in Florida and joined the carnival. So he was an illegal. So I was, uh, you know, so I was off to the army. And I, 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 was, I was scared to death that when I get back, there'd be no music career left to have. That's what they wanted. But the colonel said he would keep my name alive. So I cut five singles for RCA to release while I was away. The hardest thing was saying goodbye to mama. My going to the army made her even more worried, and she drank more. To her, Germany was the enemy. She was sure I was going to get killed even though there was no war. Pretty quick, Mama's liver went out, and she died. My world was snatched from me. 
I felt like I lost everything I'd ever had. I wasn't only losing a mother, I lost my best friend, the only one I could talk to. And I missed her so much, I carried her nightgown around for weeks. I slept with it, and I cried all the time. Losing mama was the saddest thing that ever happened to me. I never really got over her being gone. People thought I couldn't take the army. They were expecting me to mess up, but I was determined to prove otherwise. So I worked very hard at it. I didn't want the other boys to say that I got it easy while they worked. I was pulling K-1 and marching with a pack and everything. So they figured, well, he's just like we are. It was good for me. I got to be one of the boys again. I've never met a, a, a better group of boys in my life. We went to clubs. I saw some shows, even went to Paris a few times. It was a normal thing in the Army, if you have a family, to live off base, and that's what I did. I always liked a big breakfast with bacon and butter and jam together with my biscuits. Sometimes I sang hymns with the boys, but I didn't do any shows in the Army because the Colonel was used to getting 50,000 a night, and he didn't want people seeing me for free. I gave autographs to fans who came from all over Europe. They were so nice. I felt I'd come back to Europe and tour one day. What kinds of bad experiences did you have in the Army? Well, in Germany, the whole time, I was very worried about my singing career, that other acts would come along and my audience would go with them. Also, Daddy started seeing a woman named Dee Stanley, and I resented the hell out of it because Mama had been in the grave just a few months. And they'd go off into a bedroom and she'd holler so loud, and it was like they was killing hogs. I knew Daddy was lonely, but I'd have to listen to these escapades. And Daddy, he'd say, I got no right to complain, because Mama had worried herself to death on account of me. Then uh, fishy things started happening. Whoever got me drafted tried to finish me off over in Germany. I was invited to the BMW factory. They gave me a 507 to drive. I took it on the Autobahn, and the brakes went out. I wrecked the car, but I wasn't hurt. Tell me, how could a brand new vehicle have bad brakes? And how come the newspapers said I was dead? Another time, I was driving a Jeep in the dead of winter, and an officer, who I didn't know, said he'd rig up a tank heater to the motor to keep me warm. But he hooked it up to the exhaust, and the next thing, I'll wake up in the hospital. The Army covered it up. They said I'd had tonsillitis. Another time, skin doctor gave me some face treatments. His name was Lorenz Landau. He met a pass at me. So I whooped him real good. Then he tried to blackmail me. But Daddy got the FBI into it, and the doctor disappeared. And then someone tried to blow up my house. The Army blamed it on East Germany, but they had nothing to do with it. types of women or kinds of women. What kind of a one would you pick for yourself? Priscilla Ann Ballou was a five foot three inch, 14 year old army brat. Of all the women in the world, why did you choose her? Well, it's true. I had guitars older than her. But Priscilla came to my party, and when I saw her, she was the spitting image of my heroine, Mary Marvel, from the comic books. I mean, the structure of Scylla's face was unmistakable. The turned up nose, the sharp chin, the strong jawline, the big blue eyes. Scylla was my Mary Marvel. Wait, but wasn't Mary Marvel Captain Marvel Jr.'s sister? Well, yes, a long lost sister. 
See, I, I had another Mary Marvel that got away, an actress, Deborah Paget, but she was dating Howard Hughes, and his goons were watching us all the time. Because Scylla was so young, I felt I could mold her the way I wanted. And I, I, I told Scylla I'd marry her one day. How would you sum up your Army experience? I became a better human being because the Army teaches boys to think like men. It gave me a better understanding of myself. I was an ambassador for America, being in Europe. It was very humbling. Maybe someday I can come back as an entertainer. Thank you very much, Mr. Presley. Thank you very much. Arrivederci. Oh, well, that's Italian. When I got back from Germany, I got a great reception. But I still worried, because they easily forget about you if you're out of the public eye. I wanted to get back on stage and reclaim my audience. That two years of sobering army life changed your mind about rock and roll? It, 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 hasn't, it hasn't changed my mind, because I was in tanks for a long time. They rock and roll quite a bit. And being back home at Graceland was fantastic. Hardest thing was, Mama wasn't there for the first time. And Daddy moved in D. Stanley. But I told her she'd never replace Mama, and she couldn't stay in Mama's room. So she and Daddy moved into the house out back. I'd worked on my voice in Germany with Charlie the whole time. I added some power, singing from the diaphragm. I, I, I heard a song over there, O Solo Mio. And I recorded It's Now or Never based on that. But you didn't return to music. You began making movies, right? Here's what happened. I taped the Frank Sinatra Timex special. And before the show, Frank introduced me to some boys he said were friends of his and said they were like family. One was named Uncle Sam and Mickey and Carl and one he called Cousin Chuck. Then, after the show, the colonel said these boys wanted me to sing at Frank's Casino, Cal Neva Lodge, then go into Las Vegas. Did you like that idea of uh, performing for casino audiences? Yeah, um, but Sammy Davis insisted on taking me to dinner. No colonel, just me and him. And that's when he thanked me. He said I brought the beat to white audiences and opened up radio stations to black music. He said that I, I busted open the door for singers like Little Richard. And then he said, now I'm going to pay you back. And then he said, Frank Sinatra's friend, Uncle Sam, was no uncle of anyone. That his real name was Sam Giancana. And Carl was Carlo Gambino. Chucky was Charles Lucky Luciano. And Mickey was Mickey Cohen. And then he said, do you get it? Stay away. Don't make pictures or anything. Otherwise, you'll end up property of the Italian mafia, just like Frank and me. Did this scare you? Yeah, I did. Because back in 56, the colonel had me sing at New Frontier in Las Vegas. I played the lounge with Liberace for two weeks, and the colonel gambled the whole time. The colonel lost a half a million dollars at roulette, and they stuck a gun to my head. The colonel wrote an IOU, and we barely got out alive. Of course, I didn't get paid. Did you complain or demand the colonel pay you? No. Uh, everything was moving so fast in those days, there wasn't much I could do. I, I was even afraid to tell Daddy. Anyway, after what Sammy Davis had said, I, I told the colonel I was going to make pictures. And that's what happened. First picture was G.I. Blues. And just like that, the press changed my image. The rowdy country bumpkin Elvis the Pelvis was gone. Now, I was an upstanding all-American young man, a middle-class hero in Hollywood. the movies and your new start in Hollywood. 
The, the, the first thing, I got back at Frank Sinatra for criticizing my music by dating his girlfriend, Julia Prowse. She was my co-star in G.I. Blues. I'd got the Rat Pack feuding with the Memphis Mafia, but we'd get into fist fights sometimes. At Paramount, every movie star wanted to meet me. At first, I thought he was fantastic. There was Clark Gable, Burt Lancaster, cowboy stars like Glenn Ford and Durango Kid. I used to pay 12 cents to see their movies back in Memphis. And I met Charlton Heston. I called him Cowboy Moses. But really, those sons of bitches didn't care about me. They only invited me out because a lot of women came around. He's a high-flying stock car jockey. Yes, it's Elvis as a singing, swinging cowboy in an eye-popping riot of explosive hilarity. So how would you characterize your film career? Well, that the only thing worse than watching a bad movie is being in one. The scripts were all the same. Schlock formula. I, I would beat up a guy and then sing a song to him. You see, the colonel had told the movie studios, give me a million dollars, and you can shoot Elvis in a phone booth if you want. But each picture took me further from my dream of being a serious actor. It became a travelogue, Hawaii, Acapulco. They even had me play my same damn role twice, in the same picture, a blonde-headed me in Kissing Cousins. I was so mad, I'd cut up with the boys on the set. The director tried to get rid of them, so I said, whoa, let's get one damn thing straight. First of all, this script ain't worth a damn. And second, if my boys go, you can kiss my ass goodbye. But no matter how silly, my pictures always made money. Paramount used it to make Beckett for Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton. Why couldn't they spend it on making great pictures with me? And the colonel turned down dramatic roles because there was no music. You see, all the movie songs went through the colonel, and they sucked like donkeys. The son of a bitch took 50% of everything from me. Then he shaked down the writers for 50% of their cut. The result was the best songwriters stayed away. And I got old-fashioned songs that didn't maintain my singing career. I. I I couldn't turn Manira into music, man. I, I, I tried to fight the Colonel, but I realized I'd have to finish out my movie contracts to win back my audience. Well, then why did you stay with the Colonel? Actually, I was a very loyal person, and I, I was taught to obey and respect elders, no matter what. And when I went to Germany, the Colonel worked hard to keep me as a star. Anyway, I wasn't concerned with the business of my career. You know, I, I was concerned with my fans and being the best I could be for them. A lot of entertainers had contempt for their audience, but not me. Did you like doing all the fight scenes? Oh, yeah. And there was fight scenes in every picture. And I had learned karate in the Army. And it was new to Hollywood at the time. Once, I even punched my horse. He wouldn't listen to me, wouldn't stop. So I punched him in the head. And after that, we was friends. I liked the cowboy movies. I even bought some horses and rode them at Graceland. What were you thinking when the Beatles arrived in America? I thought, while I make these damn teenager movies, the Beatles are taking over the music business. I also remember thinking, they have money why don't they get the teeth fixed? You know, they made fun of me on television. You guys are nothing but a bunch of British Elvis Presleys. He must be blind. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> and pretty soon, the Beatles were making movies like Help and A Hard Day's Night that were good. And I was doing Girl Happy and Tickle Me. It made me look out of touch. 
When they came to visit me in Los Angeles, I was not impressed. I didn't care for John Lennon. He later said the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Ringo didn't say anything. George Harrison was a wimp, and McCartney was very feminine. You know, I, I wasn't surprised when they became a big part of the hippie element and drug culture. They started talking about taking drugs. How often have you taken LSD? About four times. I thought he was awful. The Beatles were terrible examples for kids to idolize. Well, what kind of movies did you want to make? Just something more challenging than Hollywood's image of me. Yeah, you know, the, the, the image is one thing, and the human being is another. It, it's, it's, it's hard to live up to an image. I, I, I became very discouraged. Once, I, I was home watching television, and the Righteous Brothers sang a song I knew I could sing. So I shot the screen out. You know, I was in a unique position that they could replace whatever I destroyed. And just because you look good, don't mean you feel good. No one knew how lonely and empty I felt. I was not happy. How did the name Memphis Mafia come about? Well, it was some boys I knew from Humes High School. Marty Lacker and Red West. Billy Smith was a cousin of mine. Joe Esposito and Charlie Hodge. I knew from the Army. I had required them to wear dark suits for a respectable appearance. A reporter came up with the name Memphis Mafia, and I thought it was funny, and it stuck. Were the Memphis Mafia hangers-on or bloodsuckers? No, no. We, we loved each other. It, it was like Robin Hood's Merry Men. They did odd jobs, like look after my schedule, my wardrobe, and get me places on time. And I needed my boys for protection, because people were always coming at me. I gave them meals and bunks, sort of like ranch hands. When we first got to Hollywood, people thought we were gay. <laughs> Little did they know my house was always full of women. One time I counted, and there were seven of us and 112 women, and I gave my boys grazing rights. I was still a southern boy with simple tastes. I needed my friends from the southern world where I come from, not actors and producers. But Daddy, he resented my boys because he thought they were taking his place. Or maybe they were after my money. Daddy trusted nobody. He was worried about being poor again. I'd tell Daddy, they do all this for me, but he never understood it. He was afraid if I went broke, he'd have to go back to working in the field. He had a backache for 23 years. Were these guys in the Memphis Mafia your close friends? I, I thought so, but I, I mean, they were hired employees doing a job for me. They looked at me as a boss, the person they'd have to please or lose their position if they don't. You see, I, I was the prototype, man, the first rock star. Whether I was good or not so much, people loved me. Now, it was a heavy burden to know who were actually true friends. Why did you give away Cadillacs and cars of all kinds to both friends and strangers? Giving away Cadillacs was easier than giving clothes because they always fit. Actually, I, I just couldn't stand seeing folks that were really down. And I liked being able to help one person at a time. I mean, money's meant to be spread around. The more happiness it creates, the more it's worth. You know, it's just old paper if it sits in a bank without having anybody. You were known for affairs with your Hollywood leading ladies. How did you get away with it? Well, I, I wasn't no saint. It, it was the old double standard. In California, I did whatever I wanted, knowing Scylla was at home. I told Scylla she would read all these things, but it was just publicity for the movies. When I did get busted, I told Scylla it made me realize how much I loved her. That usually worked. But it wasn't easy meeting expectations, neither. Everyone expected me to be a star. 
24 hours a day. But I was just a human being. Women would go to bed with a star and then wake up with me. One time, I broke it off with an actress, and she was so mad, she said she had a gun. So I said, honey, I got 10. Who was your favorite co-star or Elvis girl? And that's easy, uh, and Margaret. She was the love of my life. We were very similar and understood each other. She also looked like Mary Marvel. Anne had the greatest laugh in the world. She had magnetism and sensuality, and a hot acting career, and an ego. And she could ride a motorcycle. She was the female me. I was crazy about Anne, so it was a real toss-up between Anne and Scylla. But Scylla could not compete with Anne. She was just a young girl, never did anything in her life. You see, I never saw Scylla as a partner. I was raising her. My boy said I'd made her look like a Vegas hooker. After Viva Las Vegas, I told Ann I'd marry her if she'd quit the business. That I couldn't handle it if I saw her kissing another man in a picture. And I grew up on the Southern belief that a woman's place is in the home. But Ann wasn't about to give up her career. Meantime, Scylla complained about Ann to her dad, the captain, and he threatened to sue me. And you see, he made me sign a contract to marry Scylla when he let her come to Memphis. The colonel said a lawsuit would look bad, so me and Scylla got married. What about Celeste Yarnall from Live a Little, Love a Little? Celeste was the one that got away. She was so beautiful. I got her cast because I'd seen her in Star Trek, and she looked just like Mary Marvel. She had all the sharp features, even had the red outfit. I fell hard in love with her. I asked her to come and live with me in Las Vegas, and she said yes. But then she disappeared on me. Why do you think you never maintained a lasting relationship with any one woman? Well, M Mama and I had a very deep kinship. I, I, I'd lost my twin, and Mama had lost a child. I, I had an awful case of survivor's guilt, having lived when Jesse did not. So I lived my whole life just for Mama. Even after she died, I couldn't let somebody else replace her in my life. I mean, everyone loves their mama. But whenever I got too close to another woman, I, I felt I was betraying mama. So I'd end it. Mama was the most important relationship in my life. But it crippled me in some ways. By 1968, I, I couldn't sing into a camera anymore. I, I realized I needed to be in front of an audience to feel alive. It was time to prove I was still the king of rock and roll. I, I, I felt like I was coming back from the army all over again. Actually, I had to remember how to perform. So I went to see Tom Jones to study his stage moves that he'd gotten from me. Then I did the 68 television special. That felt fantastic. And I recorded In the Ghetto and Suspicious Minds. I had to get back where the audience is and get away from home. Scylla was controlling my personal life. She'd even try to order my boys around. She'd say, get me a Coke. And they'd say, go get it your own damn self. The Colonel was controlling my business. And Daddy didn't want me spending my own money. He was trying to keep me from any fun there was to have. So I opened in Las Vegas. But after a few shows, I realized I was still not happy. I, 
I, I mean, America was under siege, man. Protests, drugs, bombs, hippies, violence. It was bad, man. The social unrest gripping the United States in the late 60s, how did that affect you? I, I was so fearful for our country. The hippie elements were destroying America. Turn on, tune in, drop out. The whole dropout thing was crazy. Do whatever you want to, get everybody to take drugs. And the Beatles and John Lennon, they were in on it. You don't need all that education. You don't need to get your, your whatever it is, the exams that you're going to finish. What for? And the hippies were pushing LSD on the youth, even as young as 10. You're introduced to LSD, a religious experience, and, um, and it can be even more important than reading the Bible six times. Teenagers were dropping out of school and overdosing on drugs. Dropping dead. And violent groups were trying to overthrow the United States. Turning America communist? Crime and violence was everywhere. The America I loved was coming apart for the first time. I was worried it might not be there when Lisa Marie got big. A bomb exploded earlier this morning in the Pentagon. Guard your planes, guard your colleges, guard your banks, guard your children, guard your doors. Credit for the Capitol bombing was claimed in a letter received by the Associated Press today, signed by the Weather Underground. We will build a revolutionary youth movement capable of actively engaging in the war against the imperialists. What did you make of the Students for Democratic Society, which became the Weathermen? The, the Weathermen underground terrorists took their name from the Dillon song. They were violent thugs. They were led by Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn. I'm not committed to nonviolence in any way. A bomb went off at the State Department early today, and the Weather Underground claims responsibility. First they started riots, then they tried to start a communist revolution. And they idolized killers like Charles Manson and Sirhan Sirhan. Even the Black Panthers couldn't stand the weathermen. The weathermen is nothing but child's play, it's folly, and they call it a revolution. We think these people may be sincere, but they're misguided, they're muddleheads, and they're scatterbrained. The underground plans to kill Ford, Rockefeller, Attorney General Levy, and FBI Director Kelly, and to blow up some buildings. Captain Marvel Jr. had fought and defeated Captain Nazi. And Bill Ayers looked exactly like him. So I gave Bill Ayers the nickname of Captain Nazi. It made sense. They both wanted to destroy America. Did you support civil rights? Um, I believed in it. I grew up with black folks. I had a tremendous kinship with them. I listened to Martin Luther King's speeches over and over. He was so inspirational. But the Black Panthers were violent. Now, Leonard Bernstein said, Elvis introduced the beat to everything. The music, the language, the clothes, a whole social revolution. The 60s comes from it. So, in a way, were you not responsible for the youth culture, for unleashing all of it? I, I, I think, with my music, I tapped into a spirit of personal freedom. But that just as easily could have been used for the positive, not destroying anything. Peter the Apostle said to use liberty, not for maliciousness, but to serve the Lord. You had a lifelong romance with law and order. Why did this run so deep? And exactly when did you become involved in federal law enforcement? Um, I, I always had a fascination with guns and law, even as a child. Of course, I'd served the U.S. Army, and I was a deputy in the Memphis Police Department in many jurisdictions. I donated to police charities and had friends in law enforcement everywhere. They were under siege, man. They were targets. Bomb went off in New York City Police Headquarters. 
We no longer simply resist the pig. We have gone on the offensive. In about early 1970, the weatherman bombed a San Francisco police station and killed a sergeant who I knew. The device was filled with heavy one-inch staples. The staple pierced the skull of one policeman. He is in critical condition. In San Francisco, Police Sergeant Brian McDonald died today. The Associated Press has received a letter signed Weatherman claiming the radical group planted the bomb because, quote, the pigs in this country are our enemies. We will escalate our attacks until imperialism is defeated. We will escalate our attacks. I knew I couldn't go on just singing. If I did, I would be an accessory, pacifying my audience with music while the bad guys destroyed our country. And I, I, I realized the weathermen did not consider me as a part of the establishment. I felt I could help America if I became a federal drug enforcement agent. Now, you were the original cool, with the look, the clothes, the attitude, the swagger. Are you saying the man who invented cool wanted to become a narc? That's right. I felt God wanted to use me in a much more important way. You know, my family had lived in public housing at the Lauderdale Courts in Memphis. Now I wanted to give back to my country that had done so much for me. I was a child, ladies and gentlemen. I was a dreamer. I read comic books, and I was the hero of the comic book. I had always dreamed of being an American hero, like Captain Marvel Jr., who comes in and saves the day. Captain Marvel Jr., he had this fantastic dual image, a normal, everyday guy with a secret identity as a crime fighter. You know, I, I played a hero in all of my movies. Now, I wanted to be one in real life. If I could help save America, Maybe this was my real destiny that God had prepared me for all this time. <laughs> President Nixon was starting a national crusade against drugs. So I went to Washington and took a letter to the White House, and the president agreed to meet me. Dear Mr. President, first, I would like to introduce myself. I am Elvis Presley, and I admire you and have great respect for your office. I have great concern for our country, the drug culture, the hippie elements, the SDS, Black Panthers, etc. Do not consider me as their enemy, or as they call it, the establishment. I call it America and I love it. Sir, I can and will be of any service that I can to help the country out. I can and will do more good if I were made a federal agent. Sir, I am staying at the Washington Hotel. I am registered under the name of John Burroughs. I will be here for as long as it takes to get the credentials of a federal agent. Respectfully, Elvis Presley. did you and President Nixon discuss? Um, first thing he said was, you dress kind of strange, don't you? So I said, well, well, I, Mr. President, you got your show, I got mine. Later, I saw that I had put on too much mascara. But I showed him some of my deputy badges, and I gave him a World War II Colt 45. And then I, uh, I, I told the president I admired him. But I, I had great respect for his office, and I told him I wanted to help people respect the flag because it was getting lost. I also said the Beatles had come to this country with their filthy, unkept appearance and the drug music and promoted an anti-American theme. And he said I was right. Then the president said that drug users were the leaders of anti-American protests and violence. And he said, dissent is a result of young people using drugs. And I said he was right. Well, wait, was it not ironic that you were offering to help to fight drugs when you yourself were a drug user? No, no, absolutely not. I never used drugs. I didn't even drink alcohol. 
I took prescription medications only, always from a doctor for medical conditions I had. How much sleep do you get? Well, I average about four or five hours a night, I guess. Is that enough? Well, it's really not, but I'm used to it, and uh, I can't sleep any longer. I, I, was, I was an insomniac. I had a history of nightmares and sleepwalking going back to childhood. Mama would remove the doorknobs so I couldn't walk out the house in the middle of the night. In the Army, they would issue us Dexedrine. It was to help stay awake when you had to. The hippies were using LSD, marijuana, heroin, drugs that were killing people. Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin had died within two weeks of each other. Anyway, I, I told the president I was just a poor boy from Tennessee who wanted to serve his country by taking down groups like the Weathermen and the Black Panthers. And I could do it because they would trust me. And how did Nixon react to your offer? The president got very excited, and he said he was proud of me. He called the director at the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs and told him to make me a federal drug enforcement agent. It was the most wonderful moment of my life. I was finally starting my real destiny as an American hero. But wasn't your becoming a federal agent public knowledge? Yeah, but uh, everyone thought I just liked to collect badges. I mean, who in the world would ever suspect Elvis Presley was a federal agent? No one, never. And the most effective agent is the one least suspected, who has another job. And if anyone asked my opinion about anything, I said I was only an entertainer. What is your opinion of war protesters? And would you today refuse to be drafted? Honey, I just, I just tend to keep my own personal views about that to myself. I'm, I'm, I'm just an entertainer, and I, I'd rather not say. Did you get any kind of training to become a federal agent? Federal agents had to do three months of weapons training and physical combat. They let me out of weapons because of my army service. And I did martial arts on my own. That's why I became an eighth degree karate black belt. Why is your federal agent badge not on display at Graceland? Cause it's, uh, cause it's here. It's with me all the time, man. Check it out. And by the way, you're all under arrest. No, I'm just kidding. With the promise of serving the country, were you happy now? Very much so. I've been serving the devil, the Hollywood machine, for such a long time. I, I, I needed a higher calling to put meaning in my life. I hadn't done anything I was proud of in 12 years. I felt God had given me my talent to arrive at this day when America needed me, to stop the drug culture and to keep the America haters from destroying it. Captain Marvel Jr., he had fought and defeated them. And now it was my turn to fight to save America. My turn to fight for freedom. I was going to be America's secret weapon, just like Captain Marvel Jr. was. first assignment as a federal agent they told me to go on tour and wait for instructions I was very excited so first thing I had stage costumes made up so I would look like Captain Marvel jr. I got jumpsuits made with capes gold boots and utility belts and I started practicing all his moves
Then I put Captain Marvel Jr.'s lightning bolt everywhere. On my jewelry, on the jungle room wall at Graceland, and on my new airplane, the Lisa Marie. I was the only entertainer to have his own airplane at that time. TCB, taking care of business, was my way of saying to the bad guys, I'm going to put you away. In a few weeks, I got assigned to an undercover operation, COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program. My job was to penetrate the weather underground so the FBI could arrest Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn and put them away. The FBI has been looking for the leader of the terrorist Weather Underground, which claims responsibility for several fatal bombings. In Captain Marvel Jr. number 24, he had fought the weathermen. It made me realize even more that being an American hero was my destiny. It could not be a coincidence. The Justice Department began to send strike forces into various cities. 13 strike forces have been established. Can you give me details on how you fought the weathermen? My job was to set up drug stings on the weather underground terrorists. The colonel would book my shows into target cities, and I'd run the strike force. The, the, the first thing, I'd put on my drug enforcement agency staff tracksuit. That was like my official uniform when I wasn't on stage. Then I'd get on the Lisa Marie and fly. Man, I, I felt like I was Captain Marvel Jr. flying in, you know, to save the day. I swear, I, I could feel Captain Marvel Jr. flying with me. It was fantastic. As soon as I landed, I had FBI agents set up surveillance around my hotel. And their informants would put the word out on the street that Elvis's boys, the Memphis Mafia, were selling pills and powerful drugs. Dr. Nick wrote the prescriptions for everything, sedatives, narcotics, amphetamines. The, the weathermen were drug users and were dealing to hippies, so they'd send some boys to buy. When the deal was done, I, I, I would call the FBI agents on my federal agent briefcase phone. The agents would follow them back to their safe houses identify them, and wiretap their phones. Sources close to the FBI say the radical group, the Weather Underground, received money from Cuba. Don't be deceived, man. The weathermen were not anti-war protesters. The revolutionary movement began to fight. They, they were radicals fighting to defeat America by violence. The weathermen had trained in Cuba and got money from Cuban intelligence. So Captain Nazi became Bill Ayers, FBI codename. Did you do anything other than the drug stings against the weathermen? Well, the weathermen were against monogamy. So I recruited pretty girls out of my audiences. It was like fishing. I'd hook them with a scarf. Then I'd ask them if they loved America. If they said yes, I'd introduce them to the FBI after the show. Beautiful women were easily accepted by the weathermen. They would just hang around outside and get invited in. That's how we got their safe houses bugged. New York police arrested six persons described as members of the radical weatherman group. The indictment alleges that the group formed a central committee to direct bombing operations in Chicago, Detroit, New York, and Berkeley, California. Were all of your efforts against the weathermen successful? Yes. By about mid-1973, Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn and 12 others were indicted for murder and terrorism. But for a trial, I would have to testify, and that would blow my cover. So the FBI dropped the case, they said, for national security. I, I was not happy about it. But, but, but by now, the FBI considered mafia crime as the biggest danger to our country. So for my next assignment, they ordered me to use my connections with Frank Sinatra 
and the Las Vegas casinos to infiltrate the Mafia. It was called Operation Fountain Pen. Before I ask you about that, was performing for the fans as important to you as the drug stings? I, I had learned how important it is to entertain people and to give them a reason to come and watch you play. So I made each song sound like we played it for the first time. And the people loved it. I mean, my warm-up act, Jackie Kahani, had to say I'd left or people wouldn't go home. Elvis has left the building. I was finally happy now. I was performing for the fans and using my secret identity to help America. Fantastic. Still, the lifestyle wasn't good for me. In the hotels, I'd stay up all night and then sleep all day. Then I'd have to take Dexedrine to wake up. I was fighting my body and I knew I couldn't keep it up forever. Also, I missed Mama, and I knew my fame had killed her. And the more famous I got, the more it hurt. So I started taking a lot of pills for pain. The most exciting show I ever did was from Hawaii, the first satellite telecast by any musician. It's uh, very hard to comprehend it. In 15 years, it's hard to comprehend that happening. To, to all the all the countries all over the world via satellite. Yeah, the, the 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 people of Hawaii are among the most friendliest I'd ever met. I made up an American Eagle costume to show I was standing up for America. It was seen in 36 countries by half a billion people. Man, that's a lot of people. Why didn't you ever do an international tour? You know, I always wanted to. The Beatles came here. The Stones came here. Why couldn't I go over there? The colonel said he was getting his United States passport, but he never did it. I like to live up to my reputation of being a nice guy. This is it, folks. I knew something fishy was going on, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Why didn't you accept Barbra Streisand's offer to be in A Star is Born? You'd made comebacks on TV, in concerts. Why not the movies? Two things. Barbara's boyfriend, John Peters, was nothing but a hairdresser, never directed anything. And, and, and second, the storyline was my character takes illegal drugs. And that was not appropriate for a federal drug enforcement agent. Is your wife Priscilla with you? No, no she's not. When karate instructor Mike Stone began dating Priscilla, is it true you put out a hit on him? Priscilla was taking karate from him, and then he started with her and she began posing for nude photographs. So I did set up a hit on Mike Stone with one of Frank Sinatra's friends. But the FBI picked up the plan on a wiretap and made me call it off. But, but, but I wasn't upset I was losing her. In my mind, I was upset that something was being taken away from me, and I didn't like the way it looked to the fans. Sad thing is, you can love someone and be wrong for them. I should have married a southern girl. The culture is very different. Deep down, I wanted to be a family man like I promised Mama. But I was serving too many masters. OK, let's talk about your next assignment, Operation Fountain Pen. Operation Fountain Pen. The big mafia crime families, Gambino, Colombo, Bonanno, were extorting millions and committing crimes of all kinds. They'd even made Jimmy Hoffa hand over the Teamsters Union pension money to build casinos in Las Vegas. Pension fund money bought the stardust. At least $15 million went to the dunes, well, apparently through the good offices of alleged syndicate gambler Frank Rosenthal. And the mafia was taking over the music business. They were paying off radio stations to play records. Payola. A federal grand jury in California will soon investigate the multi-million dollar record business. Drug dealing, payola, mob connections, and high living at company expense. America needed me again. 
The House Crime Committee heard testimony from an underworld crime figure who linked the name of entertainer Frank Sinatra with certain organized crime dealings. Frank Sinatra fronts points for uh, Raymond Pachiaka and Jerry Ann Jewell on the Fountain Blue, and he fronted points for them in the Sands and Tahoe. Was Frank Sinatra a made man? Frank wasn't a made mafioso, but the mafia made him. They set him up as owner of the Calneva Lodge Casino and some horse racing tracks. Frank was the front man. Those kinds of places attracted politicians who could be blackmailed to keep the heat off. Frank would set them up with mafia mistresses. So better to say Frank Sinatra was the mafia's insurance man. President Kennedy had an intimate relationship with a woman who also was the girlfriend of a Chicago mafia boss. We were introduced by a mutual friend. I was introduced to Sam Giancana by the same friend. Giancana was murdered last June while cooking spaghetti in his home. So the colonel booked me into the Las Vegas casinos, and I started the drug stings again. I put on my DEA tracksuit, and I'd get on the Lisa Marie and fly in, like I was Captain Marvel Jr., coming to save the day. It was fantastic. Wait, let me get this straight. You're saying you set up drug deals between the Memphis Mafia and the real Mafia? Ironically, yes. Exact same as we did with the Weathermen. I ran drug stings on mob crews who were dealing drugs, and they were all dealing. The FBI tracked them back to their safe houses and bugged them. We had uh, wiretaps. Conversations that took place over it could be overheard at least a half mile away. That's how the FBI got the Italians for some of everything. Killing, drugs, loan sharking, kidnapping, arson, you name it. What effect did this have on the Mafia? It was very effective because the FBI was clever. To confuse the mob, they took down only one guy at a time. They got so paranoid, they started killing each other. Suddenly, gunshots, a whole series of them. And Joe Colombo Sr., accused of being a gangland chieftain, now near death with a bullet in his brain. Everyone was a rat. They never dreamed it was Elvis Presley. One time in Las Vegas, me and Red West hauled a wise guy off on an airplane. I flashed my badge, and the passengers saw me. But they thought it must be a guy masquerading as Elvis. Another time, we did a bust in Colorado, and I got presents for the cops. He was so grateful for the assistance of three members of the Denver Police Department, he picked out three Mark IV automobiles. When the mobsters got arrested, they put their wives on television, and those women sure didn't look like much. It was pretty sad. All of them claim the FBI is harassing their families. They sit in front of my house. They bother my husband. The FBI doesn't gamble. They don't drink. They don't go out with girls. What do they do? Why do they become priests? What was your most memorable sting operation against the Mafia? Um, the first one, because I was so nervous. While he was in prison, Joey Gallo made a deal with the Black Panthers to sell heroin. The FBI was terrified of the muscle of the Panthers and the smarts of the mob teaming up. So I got Dylan to introduce me to Joey Gallo, and I set him up. How well did you know Bob Dylan? Uh, we'd met only once when I, I recorded a song of his. I, I, I told him I admired his serious songwriting, and he told me my voice made him feel like he was busting out of jail. Dylan was a conservative, small-town boy, just like me. I mean, he did shows with a giant American flag, and he dumped that awful Joan Baez when she tried to push him into leftist politics. Anyway, Joey Gallo got killed on a contract hit in Little Italy. Did the mob ever suspect that you were a DEA agent? One of my boys messed up and gave a picture of us wearing police badges to the newspapers. Frank Sinatra called me in a panic, but I assured him it was only a joke. Another time, a wise guy recognized my revolver was issued only to federal agents. So I told him I got it from Frank Sinatra. 
Were there any big problems with the Mafia drug stings? Biggest problem was the Colonel was a degenerate gambler. He gambled 12 hours at a time. In fact, the Colonel was one of the top five high rollers in, in Vegas. He played roulette by dropping chips on every number. So even when he won, he lost. Heck, the Hilton let him use two balls on the roulette wheel, and he still lost. So the Colonel's debt got bigger and bigger, and all the time he was writing IOUs to the casinos. The Colonel was becoming owned by the mob, and that was dangerous. I should have dumped that son of a bitch, but loyalty was my biggest flaw, and that's why I did two shows a night in Vegas on account of the Colonel owed so much money. The FBI files show you began to get bomb threats. Do you know who was targeting you and why? There's no doubt in my mind that Captain Nasi and the weathermen suspected me of setting them up. And, and uh, they wanted to assassinate me with a pipe bomb so I could not testify against them. So I started fast moves to avoid being an easy target. I carried a gun on stage at all times. My boys had guns too. And that's not the only thing. Captain Nasi started spreading rumors that I was a drug user, thinking he'd get the DEA to fire me. I was so mad I went off on stage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Rumors that you hear about me are trash. I'm an eighth degree black belt in karate. I am a federal narcotics agent. I am, I swear to God. On the contrary, I have to be straight as an arrow. I don't drink booze, I don't take any of this. Now. By God, don't say booze, son, I'll whoop your ass, because I'm telling you the God's truth. Thank you very much. About mid-76, the FBI overheard the Gambinos on a wiretap saying the Memphis Mafia set them up. So I had my dad fire them, hoping that would take the heat off, and my boys played alone. We were given three days' notice by his father and a week's pay after 16 years, and he wouldn't talk to us himself. He flew out of town, and he had his father do it. Were you getting worried? Yeah, because pretty soon, the mafia started cleaning house to find a rat. And a, a Colombo wise guy named Vinny, I'd never met him, came backstage for a drug buy. I had a 22 revolver sticking out of my boot, some cheap thing I'd got at Kmart. And Vinny kept staring at it. So to gain his confidence, I said, hey, you want it? And he said, sure. Next thing, there were 20 inside murders, and I come to find out they used my gun. In recent months, 20 people who may have been FBI informers have been murdered. This is the type of gun used for the executions, available at most sporting goods stores. Police say the Mafia did not use this kind of weapon until recently. I was worried it'd be traced back to me. Next thing, they thought Frank Sinatra might be the rat. They tried to kill Frank by blowing up his plane they had leased from a Mafia front company called Jet Avia. But his mama got on the plane instead of him. A snowstorm today hampered the search for Natalie Sinatra and three others who were aboard a chartered jet plane that vanished last night. Then somebody tried to put a bomb on my plane in Pittsburgh, but the FBI stopped it. So of course I was worried. Them boys believed the only good witness was a dead witness. next in June of 77 the FBI told me my life was in grave danger they had wiretapped a meeting at a mafia social club in Brooklyn Bill Ayers and some Black Panthers and a Gambino mobster named Paul Castellano was there they all agreed I must be a federal agent and they put out a contract on me the weathermen the Panthers and the mafia a triple threat what did you do well, I, I was very nervous. It would be easy for anyone to shoot me on stage. Bullets would not bounce off me like they did Captain Marvel Jr. So I called President Carter and I asked him for Secret Service protection. But he said it was something only the president could have. So I told him I was running for president. He laughed, but said he would recommend me for the witness protection program. 
But I realized if I was alive, that Lisa Marie and Daddy would be in danger. And Mama had died so young, and I'd lost my twin brother. I had to find a way to live for them. That's when I remembered Master Comics number 110, Captain Marvel Jr. and the Hidden Death. I must have read it a hundred times. It was where Captain Marvel Jr. faked his own death to deceive his enemies. Then he defeated them and came back as a hero. That was my way out. What about giving up your music career? It was at a dead end. And I, I, I couldn't make any money selling records because in 73, the Colonel had sold my royalties to RCA to cover gambling debts. By early 77, the Colonel was into the Las Vegas Hilton for 20 million. The FBI tipped me off that he had sold half my contract to Paul Castellano to pay it off. I wasn't working for an Italian crime syndicate. Since I got back from the army, my career was kind of a living death anyway. And, and all those bad movies, now I was just an image in people's minds. So why not just kill the image and come back later as my own damn self? I, I could work undercover to defeat my enemies like Captain Marvel Jr. had done. Then, after a year or two, I could return as an American hero and restart my music career. Just like when I came back from Germany. It would be fantastic. What did the others think about the fake death idea? Colonel Parker, Dr. Nick? The Colonel said it was a great move, public relations wise. That it'd be a great way to make money off the fans. You see, the Colonel couldn't control me anymore in life. I was sick of him. I was more valuable to him dead. Dr. Nick said it would help me get off the prescriptions. I had come to realize that just because I was getting it from a doctor didn't mean it was good for me. Today, entertainers admit it, and they go to drug rehab, and the fans don't mind. But you couldn't do it at that time. How did you put the plan together to fake your death? We came up with a fantastic design, just like Captain Marvel Jr. had done. Dr. Nick had a terminal patient with no family who was a big fan, and he looked a lot like me, my height, my age. So Dr. Nick suggested that we let him come to the pool house at Graceland to live. Then, when he expired, we could swap his body for mine. And Dr. Nick gave him some cosmetic surgery, got him looking even more like me. What was his name? Roscoe Holloway. He was from Germantown, Tennessee. The, the only problem was Roscoe was heavier than me. He went about 250 and I was only 170. So I ate a lot of ice cream and fried foods, especially late at night. So we would match up when it came time. But how could you possibly pick a date for Roscoe to pass away? August 15th was our target date because I had to testify for a grand jury against Frederick Pro. He ran Air Cargo Airlines out of Florida. It was a mafia front company for stealing aircraft. I had sold him one of my airplanes in a sting. Dr. Nick was sure Roscoe would expire in time. And then he'd keep him on life support. So we planned the body swap and everyone's job. On August 15th, I put on my DEA staff tracksuit. I testified for the grand jury. Then I went home. I went to my dentist around 11 p.m. since I wouldn't be able to see him for a long time. Then, then I got everyone out of the house, my cousin Billy and my girlfriend Ginger. She looked just like Mama when she was young. I, I, I called her Little Gladys. We went to play racquetball. At what time? It was around 2 a.m. Once we left the house, Dr. Nick went to the pool house and took Roscoe off life support. Then he and Joe dressed Roscoe in my blue pajamas and put his body in my bathroom closet. Ginger and I went back to the house around 6 a.m. and went to bed. After a while, I, I told her I was going to read in the bathroom. Then I, then I took a sedative Dr. Nick had given me and I, I went to sleep on the bathroom floor. At about two in the afternoon, 
Ginger woke up, came into the bathroom, and saw me lying there. I heard her holler to Joe that I had fainted. So Joe came running upstairs and put on a pretty good show and called 911. Then Dr. Nick came running in. When the ambulance arrived, I, I slowed my breathing for the medics. I, I learned that in martial arts. Dr. Nick ordered them to put an oxygen mask on me and fetch a stretcher. That's when we did the body swap. I got into the closet. Dr. Nick put the oxygen mask on Roscoe and set him on the floor. Then the medics came back and put Roscoe on the stretcher. Dr. Nick went along in the ambulance so he could identify the body at the hospital as Elvis Presley. Tonight, August 16th. Good evening. Elvis Presley died today. He was 42. His doctor pronounced him dead at 3 o'clock this afternoon. What did you do next? What was the plan for you? First thing was, I had to bust out of the bathroom closet because they'd locked the door on me. Then I went out the bathroom window onto the rooftop. The, the plan was for a DEA helicopter to pick me up. And I, I was going to fly to Argentina till things blew over, then on to Kalamazoo, Michigan. But the helicopter saw a television crew outside the gate and left. So I shimmied down the side of the house and walked into the pool house. It is a scene in Memphis. Thousands of people milling around outside the mansion where Elvis Presley's body lies. Was it part of the plan to have a public viewing of the body the day after? No, no, it wasn't. As soon as my so-called death was announced, Colonel Parker got a call from Paul Castellano, who screamed at him, this is bullshit. The colonel got scared and insisted on an open casket to prove I had died. There were no cameras allowed, but the National Enquirer paid my cousin Bobby Mann to sneak one in. Now, at the public viewing, it was said you didn't look real. That's right. The problem was, as Roscoe got sicker, then being on life support, he lost weight. Well, I had gained weight. So by now, we didn't look much alike. But Daddy remembered that Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in London had sculpted my head for a wax dummy and sent it for approval. Daddy still had the wax head in his office back of the house. So we glued on some sideburns and hair. I thought the hairline was too low. When we viewed the body, his nose looked kind of puggy looking, and his hair piece, uh, something glued on somewhere, it just didn't look right. I just didn't believe it was him. Another problem was Madame Tussaud had made a 25-year-old Elvis head, so it looked too young. But in show business, you work with what you have. Then for the body, we took a wax mannequin from out of my closet where I kept my costumes. And the wax head and body caused another problem. It was so hot in Memphis in August, we had to put an air conditioner in the coffin to keep the wax from melting. Afternoon temperatures rose into the 90s. The scheduled viewing of Presley's body was delayed an hour. People began fainting. So at the funeral, they buried a giant candle and an air conditioner. It took nine guys to carry it. It looked a little suspicious. Were there any other major mistakes? Well, Joe was supposed to say I was found in the bathroom, but, but he mixed it up with an earlier story we discussed that I was found in bed. Well, he was upstairs in his bedroom, and I went upstairs to talk to him. He wasn't breathing when I got up there. Were you lying on the bed? Yeah. Another problem was Dr. Nick had me fill out my death certificate in June. He was supposed to type it up, but his secretary filed the original that was in my handwriting. What about the spelling of your middle name on the gravestone? Why the extra A, A-A-R-O-N, instead of just A-R-O-N, as on your birth certificate? That wasn't a mistake. It, it was intentional. Who wants to see their name on their grave? I had no intention of putting a hex on myself. Why didn't they drape your casket in an American flag as an ex-army officer? 
That would have been disrespectful to the flag and others who gave their lives for our country. Anything else to add about faking your death? Well, I, I, I feel badly to this day because, you know, I know Roscoe was dying, but I suspect Dr. Nick may have finished him off to keep the schedule. Four Memphis men were arrested early this morning on suspicion of trying to steal the body of singer Elvis Presley. Paul Castellano got even more suspicious after the National Enquirer published the photograph. So he sent some boys to check out the body. They broke into the cemetery, but the FBI had it staked out. They gave the police a cover story that they were going to ransom the body. The charges were dropped to avoid a trial where people might ask the wrong questions. After that, Daddy had the casket buried at Graceland. So how long did you stay in the pool house? In January of 1978, a tourist took an interesting photo of someone in the door. Yeah, that, that was me. I was, uh, I was a homeless ghost for a few months. I just read books and watched the tourists. I, I didn't realize how much pain my death would cause folks. I talked to him. And I told him that I finally made it here, but he left me. He did so much for us. He's, we love him so much. I, I, I didn't understand why people liked me. I, I mean, I hadn't done anything special for 20 years. And even then, all I did was sing. After that photograph came out, I left for Kalamazoo, Michigan, and started in the witness protection program. I worked at an old hotel as a desk clerk. It, it helped me get my confidence up so I could deal with people and not be recognized. By July of 78, I left witness protection and went back to work for the Drug Enforcement Agency. At first, I continued working on the Mafia. I, I had Joey Gallo's brother on a wiretap threatening Bob Dylan. He accused him of getting Joey killed, and he told Dylan, you better come to Jesus. For Catholics, that means you'll be forgiven if you apologize. But Dylan was Jewish, and he misunderstood. So he went and got baptized and made three gospel albums before he came to find an apology would have sufficed. That's when he went back to being Jewish. Why did you wear the Star of David? Also, your mother's original gravestone had it. You know, I always considered myself as a Jewish entertainer. According to Jewish law, I am Jewish because mama descended from Jewish females. But when I was growing up, my family told me not to say nothing because, because people in the South didn't like Jews. Even daddy would talk anti-Semitic, and I'd get real mad. But I embraced many faiths. I certainly didn't want to miss heaven on a technicality. Did you use any special disguises during those years? No, not, not really. Everyone thought I was just a damn good Elvis impersonator. They would stare and say, no, it can't be. This weekend outside Chicago, Elvis was there a hundredfold. Miles of sideburns, acres of chest hair, and the joint was jumping with jumpsuits. Love me too. The impersonators are fantastic. It's a big compliment. In fact, I go to Elvis lookalike conventions. It's the only place I'm able to connect with the fans and not be recognized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today, I got more lookalikes than anyone on the planet. No one even does a double take. But once, a young lady saw me in a supermarket and kept following me. Finally, she said, I almost can't believe it. But I. I think I know who you are. And right then and there, in the produce section, she started crying. And I said, honey, don't you cry. And she put her arms around me and she said, I'll always love you. For years, fans of Elvis Presley maintained that his longtime manager, Colonel Tom Parker, took advantage of him financially. 
The colonel once said, Elvis takes 50% of everything I earn. Why did he get a 50% management fee when the industry standard was only 15%? Tom Parker was an egotistical, obnoxious old carny huckster. He treated me like a carnival show, making money off me to feed his gambling habit. Parker does not let Presley talk to newsmen. He said he himself would do an interview for just $25,000. He did not care for me as a human being. As a carny, he viewed people as suckers, only for what he could get out of them. The colonel is the most overrated person in the history of show business. But there's more to him. I had wanted to tour Europe, especially to Germany, to repay the people for their hospitality. And there were offers, even 10 million to sing in Egypt at the pyramids. But the colonel always said no. So I figured he must have a secret far worse than being an illegal resident. I mean, he was friends with Lyndon Johnson. He could have fixed it with one phone call. I had studied about psychopaths working at the FBI, and it reminded me of the Colonel's Jekyll and Hyde personality. He was kind and cruel, stingy and generous, reckless and conservative. And the Colonel didn't have an empathetic bone in his body. So I pulled the Colonel's US Army records and found out he was discharged for being a psychopath. That's how we classify murderers. Then I read about an unsolved murder in his hometown of Breda in Holland. A 23-year-old woman named Anna Van Den Eden was beat to death in her kitchen on May 17, 1929. That evening, Andreas Cornelius Van Kook, that's the colonel, jumped onto a ship for America without saying goodbye to his family or taking any money, any clothes or ID. And that's why he spent his life denying his family in his home country. And I ended up paying the price. In 1980, I was assigned back to the Weather Underground. We got a wiretap from a secret meeting of the weathermen where they decided to split into two parts. Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn would come above ground. Fugitive from the 1960s, the leader of the violent weather underground radicals came out of hiding and surrendered to authorities. Bernadine Dorn of 1980 sounded a lot like Bernadine Dorn of 1969. Rebellion is inevitable and continuous. Resistance by every means necessary is happening and will continue to happen within the United States as well as around the world. And I remain committed to the struggle ahead. And they would filter back into society and get university jobs and find candidates for national office to force socialism on America. The others would stay underground and continue the violent revolution to destroy America. You mean a political and military wing like the IRA? Yeah, it was a long-term strategy. Their first operation was to assassinate Dr. Nick. They, they shot him at a football game at the Liberty Bowl. But he was wearing a bulletproof vest. Captain Nazi thought if they killed Dr. Nick and I was still alive, I'd go to the funeral and they could get me too. Remember, Bill Ayers was afraid of me. I, I haunted him. He was paranoid I'd find him and shoot him dead on the spot. And I would have. And Ayers was an arrogant son of a bitch. Thought he was some kind of a rock star. And now, the weathermen took money from Libya and Cuba and filled up apartments with guns and explosives for a new communist revolution. They had plans to assassinate judges, the governor of New York, former President Nixon, and building plans of New York City police precincts to murder cops again. I was hollering for the DEA to bust the gang because they were so dangerous. But they insisted on watching them to build their case. And sure enough... Police booked two men and two women on charges of armed robbery and the killing of two policemen and a Brinks truck guard. Barbara Edson is in fact Kathy Boudin, a 38-year-old member of the radical Weather Underground. They will kill people. And what are their ends? Their ultimate ends have to be the overthrow of a democratic government. And at the end of 1983, they bombed the Capitol again. 
Police said the bomb was planted in an alcove along the hall behind the Senate chamber. I was so disgusted that I quit the DEA. I mean, I caught Captain Nasty twice, just like Captain Marvel Jr. had. But they let him get away. Anyhow, it was becoming dangerous for me to work in the field, because rumors were flying that I was alive. Now, you saw Elvis where? In the grocery store in Vicksburg, Michigan. I believe he's still alive. I just believe he had a breakdown. He just got upset and he had to get away. I firmly believe that he is alive. I have seen him. How does he look these days? He looked pretty good. He uh -huh. did have his hair and he looked healthy and well. I felt like a wanted man. Gail Giorgio wrote that book, Is Elvis Alive? Gail Brewer Giorgio with her book about all the people who've seen Elvis. I can't ignore uh, what I'm seeing, and I certainly can't ignore uh, people that are very credible that say they have seen him. And TV specials aired that you didn't die. Bill Bixby did a show. Inside these FBI files is dramatic evidence that Elvis Presley may have had a life or death reason for disappearing from public view. Why the misspelling of a name on a grave? Why the moving of the grave? All that made me very nervous. Miss Giorgio went on Larry King and Geraldo and got everyone thinking. Then a man opened the Elvis's Alive Museum. On August 16, 1977, Graceland buried a wax figure, not Elvis Presley. A air conditioner was in the casket blowing cold air. After that, they came out with the Presley Commission Report. Then, DNA tests and even a newspaper photograph. I'd been a boxing fan ever since I did Kid Galahad and was friendly with Muhammad Ali. I'd been to his training camp at Deer Lake, Michigan when I lived in Kalamazoo. And I had a robe made up for him. So I went to see Ali when he was in the hospital. We left out a back exit, but somebody got a photograph anyway. So the FBI suggested a misinformation campaign. My stepbrother Rick said I suffocated in the shag carpeting. While my other stepbrother David said it was a suicide, and Joe argued against him. It worked because the public started to focus on how I died instead of if I was dead. Why didn't you come back and restart your music career at that time? I missed my singing career very much. But first problem was Elvis Incorporated. Even though Elvis Presley is dead, his legend lives on, and it's worth a lot of money. An Elvis Frisbee. An Elvis knife. If you can print Elvis Presley's name and picture on it, they've made a souvenir out of it. They've even got an Elvis Presley $1 bill, which sells for $3.95. My estate had made millions of dollars. The fans were buying up everything. Colonel Parker said if I came back, the fans would feel I deceived them and burn my records, just like they did with the Beatles. The bigger problem was two young girls, fans who were standing in line to see the casket, got killed by a drunk driver. In Memphis early today, a car smashed into the crowd outside the Presley home. Two teenage girls were killed. The police say the driver had been drinking. The colonel said if I didn't stay dead, I would be charged with murder. So I went to see President Reagan. It was great to be back at the White House after so much time. I liked Reagan. He had strong American principles. I felt he defeated the communists. President Reagan encouraged me to come back. He said it would uplift the country, and he would pardon me when he left office. But by then, Reagan was starting to forget things, and I felt I could not rely on him. So next, I got a full-time desk job at the FBI, working in intelligence. Memphis, Tennessee is about to get a new tourist attraction, public tours inside Graceland. My name is Pam, and I'm going to tell you about Elvis's den. You uh, can just picture him there. You're having fun watching television. Little wonder that Elvis Presley Enterprises takes in $75 million a year. How do you feel about all the Elvis Presley merchandising and what they've done to Graceland. They sell Elvis everything. Bobbleheads, statues, mugs.
I blame this on the Colonel and Scylla. They turned my life into a cartoon, man. But what could I do about it? I love Graceland, so I make my house here look like Graceland as much as I can. But the Elvis Presley postage stamps were a real honor. A person has to be dead for 10 years in order that a stamp can be issued, but Elvis keeps popping up in the Kalamazoo supermarket. They even recognized my service by placing a small DEA badge on my collar. Did you ever remarry? No, but I had a girlfriend, someone at the bureau for a long time. When you're not in love, you're not alive. You know, I've always loved Scylla, so I've watched over her. An unlicensed cosmetic surgeon messed up her face, so I helped send him to prison. What do you think of today's music? It's been all downhill since about 1977. Have you been involved at all in the entertainment business in the last 34 years? Well, there's no way I could perform my music live or star in a film. But you know, it's like the old song, there ain't no business like show business. So I wrote a movie script called Finding Graceland, and Scylla produced it in 1998. It was about myself trying to get back to Graceland to go home. I had a production company called Boxcar Productions. So Scylla, she let me play the tramp in the boxcar at the end of the picture. Then, I was an avatar. I got to be one of the warriors. I was fighting the bad guys all over again. I thought you didn't like making movies. No, I just said I didn't like starring in bad movies. How did you feel when Michael Jackson married Lisa Marie? I thought it was silly. I wanted to slap the crap out of both of them. Michael Jackson had an agenda. They certainly should not have used my daughter to repair his image. What did you think of the film Honeymoon in Vegas with the flying Elvises? Uh, Nick Cage was also a huge Marvel Comics fan. In fact, he changed his last name from Coppola to Cage after the Marvel Comics superhero Luke Cage. One day, he confronted Lisa Marie and said he had read all the Captain Marvel Juniors, The Hidden Death, and he figured it out. He said he was going to make a movie about me faking my death. So to protect me, Lisa married him and then filed for divorce to get all his financial records. She handed me the file and I gave it to the IRS. I put an end to it. Have you ever tried to come back again? Yeah, I I've been desperate to come back, but always needed a pardon. In 1997, I went to the White House to see President Clinton. No, I can be found sitting <laughs> home all alone. My message to the New York press. Don't be cruel. <laughs> I had information on him. At the FBI, we knew the Chinese embassy had tapped into his phone calls with Lewinsky and had blackmailed him into giving China most favored nation status. And that's how America lost its manufacturing industry. Clinton was surprised to see me because he'd been to my funeral as a young man. Whether you're black or white, whether you're country, redneck, or freak, Elvis Presley will still be the king of rock and roll. He said he would pardon me. But within a few days, the Lewinsky thing went public, and I gave up. What do you think of President Barack Obama? Well, I've been following Barry Satoro, or Barack Obama, as he calls himself now, on FBI wiretaps since the early 1980s. Really? How's that? Remember, Bill Ayers is a terrorist. So he's been legally wiretapped for a very long time. And Obama became friends with Captain Nazi when he was a student at Columbia University. They met in an SDS rally. 
the two had a lot in common. They were both ashamed of their white middle-class upbringing, and they both hated American values. Bill Ayers immediately recognized Obama as someone with ambition who was electable. So he became Obama's mentor. Captain Nazi felt Obama could one day be the ultimate Manchurian candidate for the radical left to destroy America, get rid of his Christian values, and replace it with National Socialism. Then, Captain Nazi launched Obama's state Senate campaign in Illinois, and Obama agreed to implement the Weather Underground's agenda the further he got. But communism and socialism have failed all over the world again and again. You know, the left thinks National Socialism can work in America if they have the right person forcing it down our throats. Next thing, because Obama couldn't write, he asked Bill Ayers to author his book for him, Dreams of My Father. It's not Obama's life story. It's concocted by Captain Nazi based on his own experiences. You mean like a co-writer or ghostwriter? No, no. Bill Ayers is the author, plain and simple. Obama is a literary neophyte. He's not articulate. He can barely put together two sentences without a teleprompter. Captain Nazi created the Obama we know today. Well, then should I ask, what do you think of Barack Obama as president? He's a socialist thug, just like his mentor, Captain Nazi. For Bill Ayers, compared to the pipe bombs he used to make with the weathermen, Obama is the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. And there will be nothing left of the United States if Obama is reelected. And the Weather Underground will have succeeded in their mission to destroy America as we know it. And the media circle their wagons to protect the radical left agenda every time. Captain Marvel Jr. had fought the media man. And that's how I think of the leftist media. As the Obama man. But at the core of it, leftists hate themselves. They suffer from self-consciousness. They think society looks down on them even though it doesn't. So the only way to feel better about themselves is to destroy society. Being leftist is a personal self-image problem, a mental disorder not a political philosophy. What about the Republican Party? They are, for the most part, corrupt and ignorant. Both the Democratic and Republican parties have been useless for many years. America needs another principled leader like Ronald Reagan. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I don't support any political party. I just love America. working for the FBI. Actually, I retired in December 2004, just before I turned 70. I investigated Middle Eastern terrorists after 9-11. I helped stop the spread of nukes. And then when I retired, I went back into the witness protection program. So what do you do now that you're retired? Well, I, I like to drive around in my 57 Cadillac and listen to eight tracks of my old songs. Those recordings from the Sun label, boy, I tell you, they, they got a lot of echo on them. And I still like to read poetry and some philosophy, and I go back to the scriptures a lot. I always had a thirst for knowledge since I didn't get a college education. You know, I had over 300 books I'd take on tour. I read about the supernatural and the Warren Commission report. I always felt it was a fiction novel. And working at the FBI, I found out Oswald was only a patsy, just like he said. Now, very quickly, back to Dallas Police Headquarters. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. I'm just a patsy. Really? Then who killed JFK? The best analogy I can give you is the Senate in Rome. They all had a hand in killing Julius Caesar. For JFK, it was the Joint Chiefs, Lyndon Johnson, Herbert Hoover, 
the anti-Castro CIA spooks, and the mafia families. Everyone who wanted Kennedy gone was in on it. So are you happy now? Any regrets? I believe the keys to happiness are someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. Unfortunately, I don't believe I've ever had all three at the same time. Son, I've experienced a lot of different phases in my life. I've experienced happiness and loneliness, the wealthy side, not having anything, and of course, tragedy. My life went south the day Mama died. I thought I had nothing left. And in a way, I was right. I still think of her every single solitary day. There are times I dream about her. She's always happy and smiling. And if I could have one wish granted, it would be to talk to Mama again. Fate may take you away from me, but it can't take our memory. You know, Mom and Daddy got to be extras in loving you. Special time. Now I watch it all the time. For you are here. Here came Elvis with a hot, stomping, steamy, sexy kind of music that turned people on as pop music never had before. I've always looked at myself as a young man who's been extremely fortunate. You know, a man is just a child wearing a man's body. I never expected to be anybody important. But God gave me my voice, and whatever I became, God chose for me. I feel his watching, and in a way, it's good for me. If I ever turned my back on him, I'd be finished. Do you feel good about this interview for this film? I always knew that someday the secret would come out. Your picture is going to be the key to it. I'm, I'm hoping that, that a lot of people out there are not disappointed with me. I, I, I was always deeply concerned about people's suffering and wanted to bring happiness into people's lives to uplift them. I, I, I didn't mean to put anybody through any pain. It's taken a lot to do what I had to do, but the Lord has helped me through everything, and I don't see how this should be any different, but I'm looking forward to it. You know, many times we, we despair and we think that, that life has somehow passed us by, but you know, dreams can still come true. I hope this movie helps folks understand why I did what I did and that my story will inspire folks. You know, everyone can be a superhero for America. Do you still read Captain Marvel Jr. comics? Yeah, I do. I have some of them right here. Sometimes I read them just to find out what's going to happen to me next. I just wish you would come back. Elvis fans like Irene Maletti of San Jose concede it's probably wishful thinking, but... I know his fans would, do, would just love to have that man come back again. So when this film comes out, will you make a comeback? I need the permission and protection of the U.S. government to do so. The U.S. administration has been preventing it because of what I know about Obama and Cap Nazi. But if Obama's not reelected, I'll do it. Thank you, Mr. President. Until we meet again, may God bless you as he has blessed me. And may God bless you, sir. It's nice to have a friend who listens. You don't know how much I need that at times. Uh, do you remember that we talked about live a little, love a little? Sure. Well, Celeste Nell is in my crew. She's been here the whole time. How are you doing, my little lady? <laughs> oh. Take one photo. Any final word? Well, as I once said, without a song, without a song, the day would never, the end. Day never end. Without a song, a man ain't got without a friend. A song, a man ain't got a friend. Without a song, without a song, the road would never road bend. Would never bend. 
without a song. Without a song. So I keep singing a song. So I keep singing a song. You want me to sing something? Yeah. yeah. Now after loving you, what else is there? think of this how would you like to come to my recording studio we'll make a record I, I I've always liked challenges you want to be starting something mama say mama say mama say mama say mama say mama I would like to prove that I'm better than I was yesterday just take a walk down lonely street to heartbreak 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 heart in fact every time I think that I'm getting old gradually going to the grave something else happens so let's do it for a moment, wasn't I the king? I've been gone a long time, but now I'm back. Elvis is back. You will know who I am. When that time comes, you'll know who I am. Yeah, baby. This masquerade was over. What's your favorite aftershave? Brute. What's your favorite book? The Bible, of course. Is global warming real? I, I, I don't know. The last few winters have been very cold, if you ask me, even here in California. Leno or Letterman? Letterman. Coke or Pepsi? Pepsi. Don't you have a harder question? What do you think the solution is for the Middle East conflict? Folks in that part of the world need to solve their own problems, and we need to let them. What do you think of American Idol? Karaoke contests. Fox News, CNN, or MSNBC? All of them are full of ignorance. Favorite food? Mashed potatoes and sauerkraut, mixed together. What's your blood type? O positive. Favorite movie of all time? Probably uh, the Dirty Harry films. What do you think of rap and hip-hop music? It's not music or talent of any kind. Paul McCartney was killed in 1966 and replaced by an imposter. No, of course not. That whole thing was just a joke, British humor or whatever. Any UFO connection? It would be fantastic. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Lord have mercy.